Hey, Uncle Doug. Present. I uh, here's the thing. Hmm. Uh, stories don't just they they often don't appear out of nowhere. You hmm. hear, you know, somebody heard a story from somebody else who heard a story from somebody else, and uh, and they get changed and they get moved around, and uh, and that's a time honored tradition. Sure. Uh, and I think Uncle Mark, you have something that you would like to add unto the uh, yeah the, the 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 annals of that. It's at the anals. I think it's pronounced anals. And, uh, <laughs> oh, that, yes. I'm sorry. I missed yeah, that. It's that's that's what anal means. So uh, a story. <laughs> so yes, I've I've actually plagiarized something today, and I'll, you'll understand why <clears throat> when we get get somewhere through the middle of this thing. So you know, guys, we we have from time to time been a little hard on the good book. Well, the only book that you said being, hard on. <laughs> I did after anal. Uh, <laughs> that being one or all of several dozen versions. Of the good Lord's one and only, never-changing, singular, and inerrant word, the Bible. Mm. And not just because the Bible was not written by one author, but dozens at minimum, the bulk of whom did not know the people or witness the events they were writing about, uh, which will come as, as a shock to most American Christians. And right? not because it has been compiled, uncompiled, switched up, chopped up, added to and embellished uh, by a busload of various councils and popes and bishops loads of times before it ever found its way to good King James. And, and not just because the blizzard of languages and, and dialects the various old stories were told in and then first written down in didn't always translate well into the Aramaic or the Greek or the Latin or the English versions as it traveled through space and time. And who knows how adept the translators along the way really were. It's, it's the result of an absurd game of telephone long before Jesus invented the telephone. So, <laughs> sure, all those are good reasons to kick the old brick around the cul-de-sac a bit, but... Today's main reason is the Bible is often such an embarrassing work of plagiarism. So <laughs> let us take what for some unbelievable reason is the most important story for most biblical literalists to scream from the top of Mount Ararat is literally true in every detail. That of Noah and his small family who had never built so much as a Pinewood Derby car suddenly gathering together enough timber in a scrubby desert climate to build a seaworthy wooden ship larger than the Queen Mary, and then gathering two or more, and or more is important, of each of millions of species from across six continents, which they fed without bl bloodshed with uh, food, all the while managing a <laughs> nauseating mudslide of urine and shit every single day, seven days a week, for 40 days, nights are included, so dumb, uh, plus a year of drifting once the rain stopped. Then, of course, <clears throat> the, the ark came to rest on a mountain without splitting into a million pieces, and killing everyone inside this ginormous methane torpedo, and and the year long the year long truce somehow maintained between the carnivores and their prey for however many thousands of miles it took to get get them back to their natural post flood habitats and fuck a whole population of their kind into existence. Then of course the whole story gets a lot less silly when Noah plants a vineyard, hangs out for several seasons until the grapes are worth anything, makes wine, gets plowed, and passes out naked. It's what we here at the Heretic call going the full Uncle Doug. Then <laughs> his two sons try to cover his ass up with a blanket. Ham sees his dad naked. Narrator's note, we will later learn in Leviticus. This is a huge no-no. Listen to episode nine for that. And depending on which Christian you listen to, this is either how black people happened, the curse of Ham, or, and or he was banished with his already person of color wife, suspiciously named Egyptus, to Africa, where, boom, their grandson was Pharaoh of the Bible in the sudden bustling civil civilization of Egypt, complete with pyramids and loads of other durable, pointy architecture. All it fucking makes is sense. <laughs> Why in the everlasting fuck it has to be this story that they insist is the truest one of all the true stories that the billions of people, as of this recording, who still live on, her, on this earth are descended from eight people a few thousand years ago is crazy, but it is the story that they insist upon. They could go with Job, who can say there wasn't some holier-than-thou asshole who just happened to have history's longest streak of terrible luck. Or they could go with Samson, because history is full of murdery, <coughs> pious idiots. Or they could go with a dozen others. But Noah was a real guy, and he built a stupendously huge boat with knowledge he for sure had, with labor and materials he did so have access to. The end. Except, not really, uncles. A guy did what? this all... Yeah, it's true. A guy did this all before Noah. 
or, well, the important bits, and his name was Utnapishtim, a god and a hero from the, the oldest intact written story in human civilization, the Epic of Gilgamesh. And Utnapishtim built an ark and survived the Great Deluge 1,400 years before the totally super true shut-up story of Noah found its way to Genesis. That's right. Noah and his half-mile-long poo pontoon is plagiarism, <laughs> a stolen story, or in nautical terms that apply here, piracy. He talked yeah. about, we talked about our friend Utnapishtim in episode 53. It's a fascinating story and is similar in all the important ways to Noah. The thieves who wrote Genesis <clears throat> had to do some trims. Utnapishtim's story involves conversations about multiple gods, and he himself had been elevated to a god post-flood, so these semi-monotheistic Jews uh, had to toss that. <clears throat> and of course, they tacked on all the weird shit about a drunk Noah and Ham, etc. But in every other way, they are extremely similar. How similar? Except that the boat was a cube, wasn't it? The boat, yeah. It was like, it was like 10... I can't remember what the dimensions were, but it was fucking gigantic. It was like, oh, it was a hundred meters to a side, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> and so, it was a box, and it was a it was a cube. It was a board cube. <laughs> it was a fucking board cube. Um, <clears throat> and all uh, the animals will be assimilated. But in every other every other way, they are extremely similar. How similar? Let me read you some of the lies. Lines <laughs> from the first... And lies. <laughs> yeah, sure. First... All uh, of them. First uh, from the Utnapishtim story in Gilgamesh, <clears throat> and then from the Noah story in Genesis. Shall I? Gilgamesh. Like Apsu, uh, you shall roof it. Genesis. Make a roof for the ark. <laughs> Gilgamesh. Pitch I poured into the inside. Genesis. Cover it inside and out with pitch. Gilgamesh. Into the ship, all my family and relatives. Genesis, go into the ark, you and all your household. Gilgamesh, I open the window. Genesis, Noah opened the window of the ark. Gilgamesh, on Mount Nisir, the boat grounded. Genesis, the ark came to rest upon the mountains. Uh, Gilgamesh, the dove went out and returned. Genesis, sent forth the dove and the dove came back. Gilgamesh, I sent forth a raven. Genesis, Noah <laughs> sent forth a raven. <laughs> <laughs> and it just goes on and on and on. And, you know, look, Mark, let's not quibble about who plagiarized who. <laughs> who plagiarized who. <laughs> let's and not then, bicker and argue over. <laughs> and finally, Gil Gilgamesh, the gods smelled the sweet savor, Genesis, and the Lord smelled the sweet savor. So that sure is a lot of coincidence, isn't it, guys? If, if you yeah. were teaching Creative Writing 101 in college and two freshmen turned in a creative writing assignment with these similarities, they'd have a problem, wouldn't they? So it's, it's pretty damning. So we've established that Utnapishtim was the original flood story, and since he is obviously a god of some kind and therefore was not actually real, neither is Noah the end. But did you guys think I brought you on this journey to rehash our old friend and the guy who sunk uh, Noah's wooden battleship, Utnapishtim? No? Well, just a little bit, but not really. You see, Noah cribbed off Utnapishtim, but the ancienter Utnapishtim cribbed off of an even ancienter story about a guy called Zia Sudra. It's true. So <clears throat> journey back with me, if you will, beyond the third century BCE gong show uh, of Noah in Genesis, beyond e e even the far older but amazingly intact story of Utnapishtim in Gilgamesh to a place called Eridu. Now, Eridu uh, currently is a ruin of stone and clay bricks <clears throat> almost entirely covered in sand, not far from the Euphrates River in southern Iraq. But it is a very important sand-covered ruin for a couple of reasons. One <clears throat> is it has an arguable claim to be the oldest city on Earth, meaning it may be the first place set up as a distinctly permanent settlement in a world mostly peopled by nomadic groups who followed game and seasonal food availabilities. It had stone and mud brick structures, and canals to bring the abundance of fresh water from the massive marshes that existed nearby, that is, until Saddam Hussein drained them to suppress their troublesome inhabitants, known as the Marsh Arabs. Uh, its earliest bits are believed to have been, around been built around 5400 BCE, making it uh, 7420 years old at least. <coughs> so wow. that's super cool. What's yeah, the nice. uh, Eridu. And the oldest bit uh, was the very modest 12 by 15 foot baked clay brick temple of Enki, who is a local water god that was said to have come up from a freshwater aquifer in the area. 
And as Sumerian culture grew and other cities sprung up in Mesopotamia, they recognized the city of Eridu and that tiny little temple as the first place the gods delivered the rights of kingship from heaven to man. So over time, Enki grew from the local water god of the area to a god of kind of huge importance all over Sumer. Um, <clears throat> this tiny temple was added onto and buried under additions to it, including a small ziggurat 18 times over thousands of years. So it was obviously of great importance. Yeah. And it was 75. It's kind of like the castle in uh, the Holy Grail, right? <laughs> Fell over the sake of the swamp. But the 18th <laughs> cigarette stayed. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, the Mayans did that. I think a lot of cultures did that. The Mayans did that too, where they, they built on top of, they just kept building on top of their temples. Wasn't there something of like a king? It was, it was a show of um, <clears throat> supremacy over the previous regime to just literally like one up them, <laughs> just cover their shit up. <clears throat> yeah. So it, it's 75, 75 miles north of Eridu. It, there's an ancient city called Nippur that a broken cuneiform tablet describing the beginning of kingship in Eridu and so named the Eridu Genesis was unearthed in 1893. It was translated shortly thereafter and believed to have been written around 2600 BCE. On it is what is called the Sumerian King List, which this is kind of surprised me. I, <laughs> the stupid connections that we start making, which randomly got a mention in my segment of the uh, of the ridiculous book, book, The Chariots of the Gods in episode 129, <laughs> because it lists the reigns of the pre-Deluge Sumerian kings in the tens of thousands of years, which are clearly legendary embellishments. But Eric von Daniken, the idiot author of that idiot book, took the numbers as literal truth, claiming Sumerian culture and writing must surely be half a million years old. So that's stupid. <clears throat> But one of the kings in the Eridu Genesis uh, was a guy by the name of Zia Sudra. The list, the king list, says Zia Sudra was the king of another Sumerian city, Shurapak. According to the tablet, the gods had, de had decided man had become too noisy and decided to solve the problem by sending a massive flood. Sound familiar? <sighs> the god Enki didn't want to destroy all mankind, but the decision had been made and there was no going back. So Enki called Zia Sudra over to the wall that conceals the gods behind it and whispered to him to build a huge boat. <laughs> I then, love that they're hiding behind a wall. Yeah, well, that's, <laughs> no. that makes as much sense as anything else. Uh, I'm just yeah. imagining them peeking up over it and looking at us like, what's <laughs> going on? Just like we all are right now, right? Just behind yeah, our walls. Totally. <laughs> so then this, there's a, a, a fragment missing, and we rejoin our hero Mid-Deluge, which in this possibly original version of the familiar Noah myth lasts only seven days and seven nights until at last the sun appears and Zia Sudra opens a window and makes a sacrifice to the gods. It turns out there is archaeological and geological evidence of a fairly huge regional flood in what is now Iraq around 2900 BC. And since it is big events that find their way into legend rather than small day-to-day -day ones, no, nobody remembers the legend of running some errands on a Tuesday afternoon. Uh, someone having the good luck and wherewithal to get a bunch of their shit into a sizable boat before the flood hit would, to any survivors at the time, seem an incredibly lucky fellow. Over time, if the story maintained around the cooking fire every night for years, in a time where the world was worked solely via magic and the whims of capricious gods, the lucky fellow could easily be seen as favored by the gods. And in time... If you needed a story to prove that if you do what our book says, you will be favored of the gods, just like the guy in this totally true, amazing story, the lucky fellow who heaped his shit in a boat before the flood could be very useful indeed. <clears throat> it also turns out there is no evidence for Zia Sudra having been a real person or king at all. The only mention of him being, uh, 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 being anywhere is on this one fragmented clay tablet. So for those keeping score at home, the legend of Utnapishtim, a person who clearly never existed, was grafted from the older legend of Zia Sudra, a king there is no evidence of ever having been real, <laughs> which was in turn grafted by the authors of Genesis to create a character called Noah and events surrounding him for which there is no corroborating evidence of any kind. Seems a tad shaky when you look at it that way, doesn't it, guys? <laughs> but the good news can I, is... Can I just make a point of order um, yeah. and, and just... This is for all the writers of future holy books that are um, listening to the show. Yeah. You can only say the number of nights if it's different from the number of days. <laughs> like like a vacation, right. you know, six, six days, five nights. If, if it's 
The same number. Don't fucking say it. You're wasting time. We all know it. Yeah, it's not. It really, it really isn't poetry, guys. It's just redundancy. <laughs> so the good news is everybody knows the pedigree of the Noah flood story. So nobody, certainly not in the modern nuclear armed United States of America of 2020, believes in this interesting but preposterous old fable. Can you imagine if grown ass adults who vote <laughs> actually believed in this poppycock? <laughs> that would be crazy. So, uh, so yeah, that's the story of Z- 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 Zia Sudra, guys. I seem to have this memory of this museum I went to about a year ago, but <laughs> it's pretty unclear. Yeah. I called it a museum. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Well, it, and the museum had dinosaurs as well, so that... Uh, well, that is pretty crazy. Yeah. All it makes is sense. Yeah. Well, that's uh, that's a pretty interesting, um, you know, plagiarism. It's what's for dinner. It's what's for dinner. So uh, with that, let's sail on. Let's move on. Ooh. 